short talk, but all right. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, today I've got a bit of a case study to see how how things actually operate in the real, real world when you do when you do some projects in, in Drupal 8. I know you've all uh, heard a lot of stuff about different technologies uh, and so on, but mo mostly in theory. So I'm going to just show you a bit of a how how we did that uh, in our company and how we managed to to bring uh, a project to life. Um, so my name is Jan Zavaro. I'm a project lead at Drop, which is a develop Drupal development studio uh, based in Ljubljana, in Slovenia. So first things first, like I said, we're going to talk about the the NetMate Youth. Um, many of you, are, I guess, wonder what this is. So this is a UNESCO initiative, a project that they have, which is for um, for the youth in the Mediterranean. And what they actually do is they help the youth, the young women and men uh, throughout the Mediterranean to build their own communities, uh, build their own networks, and with that, they help them in the development um, of national policies and strategies on youth. So basically, they're doing all of that um, for their own for their own good, for their own future. Um, and what UNESCO needed here uh, is a tool for them so they could update um, the, what's what's going on with the project and how to. Um, how to inform the, the public about what the project, about what the initiative actually is. Um, so with that, um, that was basically what what they came to us and pretty much how we started off is with the question, should we do that with Drupal 7 or Drupal 8? Um, the question was because at that time when we started that, um, Drupal 8 was, I think, it was only release candidate, or maybe even the development version. So it was quite a dilemma if we should actually go <laughs> go with that approach. Um, but then again, I mean, we needed uh, we needed something that was responsive, something that was easy to use. Um, we knew that there would be quite a lot of rich media content on the web page. So that meaning um, videos image galleries, documents of, of any sort, a lot of content, um, news, uh, events, and so on. So eventually we decided to go with Drupal 8. Um, it was also because we knew that Drupal, even though it was a, a release candidate version, it was still quite quite functional and develop um, all of the features that we needed inside. So everything from from multilingual uh, to, to views to basically anything that actually we needed was right there, worked out of the box and was completely, um, completely good to use. So how we started up, um, basically what we do with pretty much every project that comes into our house, um, is set up the project in, in initialization. Um, we normally use Jenkins CI so we can handle the, the deployments. Uh, this is norm I mean, probably some of you have heard of it. Uh, so what it is is just basically a deployment tool. So uh, whoever works on, on the project, whoever is the developer, um, they work on their local machine, of course. I mean, normally. Um, and then we have the development server or the staging environment where all of these changes are then being pushed. So with Drupal 7, it was quite easy because we've, we've done some, so many Drupal 7 sites. It was basically just a copy-paste project in the Jenkins. But with this one, since this was our first Drupal 8 project, we, we somehow, <laughs> I mean, it, it was not that straightforward because, first of all, I mean, Drush, Drush CC all doesn't exist anymore, right? Um, so we needed to, to, take, to take a look at what are the things that we need to do when we do the, the new code deployment to the, to the staging. So we knew that we had to update the, the database. Uh, we knew we had to revert the, the config. 
um, and we knew we had to rebuild the caches. Um, pretty much the same thing as with the seven, but just some different, uh, different logic and different commands that we need to, we need to do. Um, the other thing was Gulp, which we also use um, constantly in our projects, which is more for the front-end developer guys. Uh, what this is, is it's a task runner that we can pretty much set up anything that we would like to do to have it automated. So for example, um, in our cases, this is uh, the compilation of SAS files. This is the um, JS hint for the JavaScript files, uh, maybe some minification for the image files, um, SVG files if you have them, and basically to build up all of the source files into something that we then include inside our team, inside our module, uh, whatever. So uh, we've got the project set up, and then basically we had to start with the, with the site building. Uh, normally, like pretty much everyone else, we started up with the site building. So first things first, content types. We need to define which content types um, do do we do they do do UNESCO need. So one of the most basic, so basic page. Uh, then we needed the, the news. We needed um, events. Uh, we also needed some some sort of tool for for all of the rich media content that should be put into into the page. And one of the requirement was that these this content should be reusable. Um, at that time, everybody, everybody's first thought was media, but we all know how media went with uh, Drupal 7. Um, and then, with, then that became Entity Browser, and at that time, I mean, even, even Drupal Core wasn't that much um, develop fully, so we somehow went for a more simpler solution to just create a separate content type that was basically media, which could then uh, include images, videos, or documents, and that would then be referenced by any other content type that we have. So we basically created a smaller version of the, of the media browser, so to speak. Um, then the, the next things that we needed to do was, well, the normal stuff, the views. Um, we also have some specific block content types that, that we needed to create. Um, after that, after we had the, the pretty much the whole structure of the Drupal site ready, we of course headed on to, to the theming part. Normally what we do here, um, we somehow steered away from from the base base teams that we have, so no bootstrap team or having I don't know two or three teams uh, there to somehow just inherit all of those properties and then override them again in your template files or SAS files. So what we did, to, I mean, what we normally do is we create a team, a custom team, completely from the scratch. We do have some some sort of a boiler template of the theme, which is just a pretty much stripped down theme that we can start from. Um, so we just uh, renamed uh, the theme, um, and we're pretty much good to go to, to implement your own features, your own um, theme functions, your own SAS, uh, SAS files, and, and so on. Um, and again, it doesn't go that easy normally it's always something in in the project that you you eventually come through and you see that this won't go without any custom development so yes there was some custom development also involved um, we had some some issues with the geolocation module and also with the address field uh, they weren't that much um, there were some hiccups in the modules so we had to to fix those um, and do some some of our own custom development for that. Um, eventually, we we came through. the The project was was then finished. Um, so it says what we learned, and in one way we learned a lot, and on the other way we didn't learn pretty much anything. So, <laughs> um, the, but the thing is, 
when you do your first project, it's when you look back at that project after, I don't know, maybe 10 or maybe five, 10 projects, you look at the, your first project and you somehow just want to look away, right? Um, and, and again, just like with Drupal 7, uh, there are so many things that you can do in so many different ways, but only when you do it, I don't know, five or 10 times, or when you get um, 10 or 20 support tickets on that specific feature, only then you realize what would be the best way to do that on the long term. Sure, whatever you do on the short term, it goes pretty much very easily, but only later on you realize that that might not have been a very good idea. Um, there was also an issue, so we started off with Drupal 8 that was in release candidate version. And at that time, I think, yeah, release candidate. And at that time, you didn't have any upgrade paths from one version to, to another. Uh, so what we did is we took the config files and we did a new complete installation. Um, imported the config files, and of course, even that then went as expected. There were some issues with uh, with importing the views um, because something I think something something changed the config files. One key in there was different, so we couldn't actually import any of the views that we created. So we had to rebuild those. Um, luckily, I mean, views are not that much. If you don't do and do them very complex, they're very easy to to replicate. Um, then there was the the multilingual part. Um, the site is so initially the site was published in English. Um, right now, as we speak, the content editors are working hard to to publish the French and the Arabic version. Uh, the French version went okay. I mean, it was the same as with Drupal seven. Um, but the Arabic version, you need to understand, it's right to left, you know. So, again, it's something, something, something of a different concept that you normally come against when when you're developing or when you're theming something. Um, and then also with the APIs, um, sure, the the form alters, the I don't know, any any sort of APIs that that you have. Um, came, so, so the same logic or the concept stays from Drupal 7. Uh, you basically just need to, to adapt the new, the new object-oriented program lam language that Drupal 8 has, and with some, some additional tweaks and so on, you, you eventually go uh, to, to the correct way of doing some, some stuff. Um, this was then the, the final the final version uh, of the site that was published. Um, like I said, some some hiccups, some some new stuff that we that we learned, um, some new stuff that we know we shouldn't do anymore. Um, but now I think that Drupal has gone to a stable release and to to the 8.1 release, everything is going to be better and better as we go on and as the community grows and as the, as the modules um, are ported from the 7 version to, to the 8. So, anybody, any questions about this? So uh, the question was that uh, which are the things that we shouldn't do on the next projects? Um, well, first thing was that if you see something that's in the development release or the release candidate state, maybe you should think twice or tr three times before you start using that. Um, like I said, when we started, we started with Drupal core that was release candidate and we couldn't update it normally like you would now with with Rush very easily. So we had to do a completely new installation, config imports, and then new complications came came up with that. Anything else? Uh, I guess uh, the whole project was the most exciting part. I mean, like I said, the, this was our first Drupal 8 project.
project. So, I mean, you do those sort of thinking, you know, when you start with something new, some new technologies, you, you download it, you create a sandbox, um, and you start working on those things. But it doesn't really compare it to, to when you start working on, on something real, something that's going to be live, something that some people are going to use eventually. Um, so, yeah, the most exciting part was actually trying Drupal 8, how it behaves, um, and everything from from the complete site building to, to the new config uh, management, um, to the new core features that, that it has, basically everything. Okay, nothing else? Well, for the end, I, should like, I would like to thank to our sponsors that made this uh, event happen. So thank you all. <laughs>